Hi, Bobby. Hi. Can you hear us, Bobby? Hi, sorry, just a second. Hi, 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 hi Abba. Hi, hi. Great, I just thought for a minute that you couldn't hear us. Uh, so uh, we, yeah, we I, I couldn't for a second, but now okay. I, I can. <laughs> so I guess we could begin, uh, Nidhi. Sure. Uh, so Prashant is joining, right? Okay, he's here. Yeah. Hi, hi, Prashant. Uh, welcome to the session. Hi, Mr. Bobby Polly. Hi uh, uh, to Mr. Mundal as well. Just a moment. Am I recording it? Yeah. Hi, So I welcome all of you to the second session under the Climate Startup Showcase series being organized under the aegis of the FIKI Center for Sustainability Leadership. Uh, we would request your attention as we take you uh, through this brief visual narrative on the center. Just give me a second. Uh, there seems to be some, uh, you know, glitch here. Just a moment. Give me a second. Why don't you carry on? We'll play this in a minute. Are you able to see the video? Not to see it. Carry on, Nidhi. Are you able to hear, hear, see the video and hear the sound? Is the sound yeah. available? No, we are able to see the video. Okay. Let's do this later. Why don't you sure. carry on? Sure, sure. Just Yeah, I'm sorry for the glitch. Uh, I think there was some problem in sharing the sound. The video was coming. Uh, so welcome you all once again. Uh, so today's session focuses on sustainable agriculture and has been curated by the center's knowledge partner, eCube Investment Advisors. Uh, we have a panel of experts with us who will share their insights and feedback on the presentations by startups. Uh, we are uh, very delighted to welcome Mr. Hemendra Mathur, Chairman of FIKI Task Force on Agri Startups and Venture Partner at Bharat Innovation Fund. Uh, Mr. Mathur has over 23 years of experience in venture capital, private equity, management consulting, and investment banking industry. He has over 10 years of experience in early stage and growth capital investing, working as a venture partner with a deep tech sector agnostic, sector agnostic fund. He had earlier raised a private equity fund and managed portfolio of Miss Sites companies in this food supply chain. Uh, welcome, Mr. Mathur. Uh, our next uh, expert would be Mr. Bobby Polly, Managing Partner at One Planet Partners Fund, EQ. Uh, Mr. Bobby Polly is a seasoned investment professional with over 23 years of experience. Uh, he specializes in private equity and strategy consulting. He played a pivotal role in founding the private equity business at Tata and managing the $600 million Tata Opportunities Fund. Uh, with a track record of successful exits and championing new investments, Mr. Polly brings extensive ex uh, expertise in value creation across portfolio assets. Uh, our next uh, uh, expert on the panel is Mr. Prashant Venkatesh, Marketing Director and in India Sustainability Head at Hindustan Unilever. He leads numerous initiatives on health and well-being and circular economy at Hindustan Unilever. His strategic vision and leadership drive sus HUL's sustainability effort, um, making a tangible impact on society and environment. Uh, Prashant also spearheads uh, HUL's partnerships with Tiki's Center for Sustainability. I welcome Mr. Ashish Mondal, Managing Director of Plowman Agro Private Limited. 
Uh, he brings over 30 years of experience in improving smallholder livelihoods, sustainable agricultural practices, and promoting agribusiness initiatives. Uh, he was a member of the National Advisory Committee. He has served on key committees at NABARD and currently leads an agribusiness startup focused on connecting smallholders uh, small with agricultural value chains through farmer produce organizations. Um, we are extremely grateful to all of you, uh, our audience, for joining us at this session today. Uh, we do hope you would find the presentations by the startups interesting. Uh, some housekeeping rules. Uh, each presenter will have 10 minutes to uh, showcase their innovative solutions. Uh, following each presentation, our expert panelists will be invited to provide their valuable feedback. Uh, we have allocated 10 minutes for observations by experts. Um, time permitting, we will also take up questions from the audience. Please do put in your observations and queries in the chat box or the Q&A box. Uh, your feedback is highly uh, appreciated. I uh, now invite our first startup, uh, Mr. Srivatsa. Are you ready? Yes, all set. Mr. Uh, yeah, so I now invite Mr. Srivatsa from Tr Tracex uh, Tech. Uh, com. Thank you. I'll just quickly share my uh, desktop. Uh, do you all see my desktop, the one that I've shared? Yes, yes, please. It's visible yeah. and you're audible. All right, wonderful. Firstly, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to uh, present uh, today. Uh, I'm Srivatsa. I'm the co-founder and CEO at uh, Tracex Technologies. What we are very passionate about is digitizing the food and agriculture with an objective of achieving uh, 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 you know, several uh, outcomes, including sustainability being one of them, traceability, transparency, sustainability. But what today I'm going to be presenting very quickly to you is our blockchain-based digital uh, MRV solution for uh, monitoring climate-based, uh, nature-based uh, uh, solutions for climate action goals. Largely, uh, we started off uh, earlier addressing uh, several use cases within the food and agriculture itself. We started off with uh, farm to fork traceability, where we are addressing the need of um, uh, ensuring that uh, data can be democratically shared with everybody in the supply chain. That's the first uh, use case where we started a few years ago. But as we progressed with our customers, we realized that a lot of our customers were leveraging our platform for uh, uh, measuring their sustainability actions or uh, uh, the goals that they have set, they set themselves for net zero and so on and so forth. So if we evolved the product to be able to help our customers uh, track all the data, sustainability related data on our platform. Fast forward to that, we have uh, several customers that are leveraging our solution in monitoring um, uh, climate-based uh, carbon projects through our platform, creating eventually that leading to uh, creation of um, legitimate carbon credit. So we have customers that that measure uh, the, the activities on the ground that eventually results in uh, uh, credible carbon credits. We also uh, have extended the same solution within uh, the, within our, our uh, uh, scope to uh, address uh, specific regulatory uh, uh, norms that are coming up, especially looking at uh, in, in, the, in the realm of uh, sustainability, again, things like EUDR, European Union Deforestation Free Regulatory Act, and so on and so forth. Right, so uh, largely it's a it's a tech technology platform that leverages uh, uh, technologies like blockchain to ensure that agri and food supply chains are connected and addressing several of these use cases. Anil and I co-founded Tracex uh, in back in 2019. We both have uh, over 20 years of experience building um, you know, products for global uh, markets. Um, very quickly talking about uh, how organizations are looking to uh, mitigate the uh, uh, climate change facts, which is impacting over 3.5 billion uh, lives, is that uh, organizations are looking at um, implementing engineered solution in, in their supply chains. When I talk about engineered solution, essentially I, I, I'm discussing about uh, the the um, uh, measures that they take to uh, start uh, start reducing emissions significant emissions right so which is through the engineering means but they will always be left with uh, um, emissions that are hard to abate for which they are looking at alternatives especially when we talk about alternatives 
we're talking about either offsetting their carbon em emissions or climate financing projects so that they can inset their carbon emissions, largely leveraging nature, agriculture or nature as, as an untapped uh, uh, solution. Within the nature-based solutions, we uh, with our platform, we can cover several uh, projects, including regenerative agriculture, agroforestry, afforestation, clean water, cook stores, biochar, and so on and so forth. The whole idea is how do we um, uh, in, ensure that the ecosystems can be better managed uh, and, and carbon uh, can be um, uh, trapped inside the carbon, uh, in, inside the soil and not uh, uh, there in the uh, atmosphere, right? So out there in the atmosphere. Those are the projects which can be completely tracked on our, on our solution. But uh, there's always a challenge in uh, implementing and scaling these uh, nature-based solutions, right? So uh, for example, gross inaccuracies exist in measuring the baseline. A lot of times these projects will have to measure the baselines and then uh, uh, the KPIs will have to be set uh, for improvement. Uh, there, there's a challenge in measuring the baseline. There's always a uh, um, lack of trust in the in the data itself, the accuracy, it could be reliability or credibility of the data itself. And eventually, a lot of these projects uh, do uh, um, uh, fail uh, meeting the global certification standards with uh, global registries. So our solution to that is a digital MRV solution that will help in, uh, um, in, in creating credible data sets, uh, credible, reliable, and accurate uh, data sets, starting with uh, the baselining uh, of a project, collecting and analyzing the baseline uh, data, setting up KPIs based on the baselines that have been set up and continuously monitoring and tracking these baselines and eventually reporting them for verification and auditing purposes. When I talk about baselines, I'm essentially talking about biodiversity markers to agriculture markers to water uh, footprinting in a project, social benefits in a project and so on and so forth. There are several data points that are captured and monitored and report, uh, reported through our uh, platform. The way we do that is uh, leveraging our platform. Uh, uh, we, we, we've got uh, a combination of a mobile uh, web, uh, remote sensing, IoT integration and uh, uh, data sciences that we leverage uh, for delivering value to our uh, customers. Uh, that's the entire uh, product that we have. These this is these are snapshots of the product. The uh, Trace Grow, which is one of the modules, is a Android uh, offline first uh, mobile application that can identify deforestation, for example, as you can see, and clearly separate the deforested land from uh, uh, the non-deforested land. Then uh, uh, through uh, remote sensing integration, uh, getting the deep insights of the, at the farm level, tracking all the activities at the farm level, all the way up until the produce from the fa farm that's coming in can be uh, procured. Then uh, Trace, Grow, Trace Pro is a, is, a, is a module that will make rest of the supply chain inclusive uh, uh, and, and allows post or harvest handling of the, of the produce itself. Then uh, Trace CO2, which is a module that we've carved out specifically for carbon projects that will help us measure carbon carbon projects uh, um, and, and uh, across different uh, attributes uh, as well. And eventually a trace eye that delivers the advanced uh, analytics. Just moving, uh, the third use case uh, there is, uh, uh, is, is about, or rather second use case is, is, is all about how do we curtail the deforestation uh, so that the forest can sequester more carbon dioxide as we move along. Uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, the the uh, regulatory uh, norms like European Union deforestation regulatory uh, goal that essentially is not allowing any products to be imported into EU, which is linked with deforestation across these seven commodities. Essentially, that says, uh, uh, firstly, UDR essentially says that you will have to uh, end to end map your supply chains. There has to be availability of the farm level data. And you also have to be able to prove there is no deforestation leveraging uh, 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 that the farms are UDR compliant farms leveraging satellite remote sensing data. And then uh, eventually at the post harvest level as well, segregating the UDR uh, produce to non UDR produce and eventually deliver a product into European Union with uh, uh, complete information. That's the entire solution that we could uh, cover as well. Across these uh, different uh, uh, you know, uh, use cases. Uh, we have, uh, we work with over 30 plus customers across seven different countries is where, including India, we've implemented our solution. We've been in the business for the last four years. We are a team of 25 operating out of uh, uh, Bangalore. We've digitized over uh, 600 acres of land and about 300 plus uh, thousand uh, farmers uh, that are digitized on our uh, platform. 
We work with several customers, enterprises, export uh, companies, contract farming companies, governments, and, and so on and so forth. So forth, especially in climate uh, area, we work with Nestle for implementing the regenerative agriculture project in uh, in Andhra Pradesh. We work with several carbon project developers that are creating uh, legitimacy for the carbon credits they create on our platform and so on and so forth. Uh, depending on the use case, Customers did have benefit either for reducing the uh, overall carbon footprint to achieving their sustainability goals to or adhering to uh, their regulatory compliances and so on and so forth. So it's different benefits that are uh, derived uh, by our uh, customers itself. The solution itself is offered as an enterprise B2B uh, SaaS model. A one-time services fee and a monthly or a yearly subscription fee is what we charge based on number of users, uh, acreage uh, of, of usage and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, currently we're looking out uh, to raise a, a bridge round of about a million. Uh, we want to uh, create a, which will help us create a runway of about 15 to 18 months. And we want to get to about 75 customers. Uh, want to be ready for a series A round in 12 to 15 months uh, uh, time. And we're targeting to hit about a million dollar in revenues uh, this year. So that's that's where we are heading to. Uh, earlier, we've been supported by NAP Ventures. Um, who led our uh, last year pre-series A uh, round and other uh, uh, um, you know funds like Hyderabad Angels, Indigram Labs, and Paypal Ventures. Thank you so much. That's uh, very quickly uh, from my side. Happy to take any questions. Um, may I now invite Mr. Uh, Bobby Polly to uh, kind of come and share his uh, feedback and comments? Yeah, I just have a few uh, congratulations. I think the space that you're operating is extremely interesting. And it's a very new area. I probably think you're one of the very few players with the capabilities and the credibility of the things that you've built in. Uh, I have one quick question and then a couple of comments. One, for what you do, you know, I'm thinking of yourself like a TUV or a BBQI, which are, you know, the testing inspection and certification companies we do for engineering. I right. think in the carbon space, you probably are doing something similar, which is pioneering. Uh, my question to you is that, are there any global models of companies which have built scale around what you're doing right now? Sure. Uh, and uh, an associated point is that, would it make sense for you to partner with some of these same global companies? Like, I mean, UV, not, I mean, UV has, I think, about seven of its divisions and right. uh, yeah, focusing on different parts of the world, BBQI and the like, where uh, you actually provide them, uh, I mean, they provide the customer access because what you're doing is scalable. What you're doing in India can be done in other parts of the world at probably a fraction of the cost that, uh, you know, your, your, your service as yeah. a service model uh, yeah. could be much more cost productive for uh, customers in Europe and North America where the focus, where there is critical mass and scale today. Right? Sure. I mean, you might supply to a Growcoms who does export of various spices and things like that, but that market is still niche today in India and it's been largely limited to exporters and the like. Uh, I don't know if I've got the gist right, but I just thought... I mean, <laughs> Absolutely. I I think you did. Uh, I'm glad uh, you did that. Uh, no, you, you're right. Um, uh, so we we uh, are uh, so currently a uh, lot of our, uh, uh, the projects that are uh, uh, registered with registries like Vera and Gold are running on our platform. We have four mm -hmm. projects, uh, uh, five projects on uh, on Vera and three projects on Gold. So naturally, what we've done is we built uh, Vera's. Uh, 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 you know, project standards VM0042 is what we built into uh, our platform. So any anyone who's running, who is registered with Vera as a certifying agency and running a nature-based solution, nature-based carbon monitoring project, they can directly use our solution in, in implementing it. However, having said that, we, not, we don't yet have a a very tight uh, partnership with Vera or a Gold today, uh, and we're finding it a bit difficult sitting here in India and, and trying to get access to it. We have actually... Uh, um, made attempts to it. Uh, in fact, now we are making an attempt through uh, some of our international customers uh, to get into their uh, uh, area as well. But I think uh, that your, your point, uh, Bobby, is absolutely valid that if we can partner with them, if we can comply to, uh, if we can be a, an approved solution uh, with one of them, then we have a whole lot of access to global uh, projects. That's on the cards, but it's not been easy to get across to them uh, yet. Uh, so we are, we are in the my, my last comment before I pass it on to anyone else who might have... I mean, it's it's very difficult to build scale in this business. And there's a reason why none of the other players have, you know, whether it's the testing inspection certification kind of players have also not really gone into a public market. So things like that is because one 
because there's an NGO kind of, a, uh, but in terms yeah. of that, so therefore getting to a global business model for you is very, very critical uh, where you can actually diversify across different customer bases. So I think that's something which maybe you should be focused on trying to, uh, uh, you know, develop the business model of service for yeah. them, but also try and uh, get into partnership with several companies because scale Absolutely. is going to be difficult to come by. So to get to an exit level from your next round, especially if you raise eight, $10 million, I think that in a few years, they would, uh, your your investors would be after you to have a degree of scale, which will enable them to get an exit. Uh, Absolutely. You know, so in which case then you're ruling out all other options, but a strategic sale to them if there is not enough scale. Sure. No, that, that's a, a good feedback, uh, um, definitely. And and in India, we, we are now partnering with, let's say, IDH is our partner, IntelliCap is our partner, uh, TechnoServe is our partner. They're taking us global. We we, we started mm -hmm. with small projects here, but they are taking us global uh, because they have the scale of uh, operationalizing these projects on the ground, uh, right? And and okay. we are dependent on, on that as well, yeah. Sure. Hi, uh, so uh, may I now invite Prashant? Uh, would you like to share your... Uh observations next i think just very similar to uh mr Polly. i think it's uh firstly just really nice to see that in the last four years you've built uh such strong use cases across you know 30 different customers and across the world uh i just had two questions for you and then maybe one observation which is actually in fact very close to it what what mr Polly said first is um at any of these enterprises, who has been typically your customer? You know, has it been uh, a sustainability professional? Has it been a supply chain professional? Has it been a business owner? That sure. would be really good to see. And and particularly for them, where are they seeing value in this data? Is it from reporting? Is it from is it helping them with their business? I think that will be really just good to some get some clarity from you. Sure. I think the second second one is how is your software helping in measuring let's say yield improvement i think the i think the carbon measurement offsets is all clear sure. i think or the reduction in deforestation is clear but let's say something like for regenerative agriculture yield improvement also or the change in yield right i think that's always a challenge uh, especially when somebody is going to shift from traditional farming to regenerative farming right. how how is your is it wired for measuring changes in yield i think is a second question right. I'll answer the second question first. Uh, so we have largely uh, built our solution to organize the entire supply chain. I don't think we have deeply focused on improving, let's say, farm yields. Uh, that's not been on, on our radar at all. Right. Having said that, uh, so we may not be the best, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to say that we are a, a precision agriculture. Uh, uh, we are not. Uh, right. So, but but what what we do within our platform is if someone is implementing a regenerative agriculture uh, practices, we are able to completely cap capture the package of practices, drive that through uh, uh, through the application. But we ourselves don't generate any intelligent advisory uh, on the platform. That needs to be fed into the system, and then uh, it can it can uh, 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 put that across the farmer thing. That's uh, one part. And your first question around uh, uh, who typically are. Uh, uh, initially, when we were talking just about our, our traceability solution, we largely saw, uh, you know, procurement teams uh, uh, responsible, which which uh, held responsible, which which wanted to know uh, the, their supply chains better. They were a typical persona. But now we increasingly see the sustainability heads. There is chief, chief sustainability officer in in all uh, large uh, corporates. What we've also seen deals shifting from pure play traceability to sustainability is the deal sizes were smaller than. Uh, now we see larger sizes because uh, sustainability comes only at scale you cannot be uh, saying that you're doing a small project and say i'm i'm, I'm being sustainable right so uh, we we clearly see uh, the sustain it, it's the it's the kra of the sustainability team that's driving adoption of systems like us and within that uh, specifically what uh, uh, the way it helps is a lot of the data today is uh, spread across multiple systems uh, they're not able to aggregate it in one one uh, system and then present it to the uh, registries the way it must be re uh, presented, right? So that's that's the biggest problem that we are solving today. One is digitizing at the farm level data. Today, it's not that uh, the carbon project developers are not able to get credits for their carbon credits without a solution like us, but it's all my, the entire PDD as it's called project uh, documentation is is all managed through Excel's and and uh, Word documents and so on and so forth. We are actually completely digitizing that part. 
and providing ability for them to directly list their projects on Vera and Bold, uh, right? Mm -hmm. And and capture this data all across. And also we are, by the way, partners with uh, SAP as part of the startup program. I'll just take 20, 10 seconds more there. And um, we are uh, we are in, we have integrated our solution with SAP's uh, core product, which is called Control uh, Sustainability Control Tower, where SAP is drawing information from system like us for the scope three emissions, which is at the farm level, right? So I, I think that's the that's where we are helping significantly improve the quality of the data, capturing of the data, and building uh, verification for the data itself, which will uh, eventually improve the quality of of, the, of their uh, uh, projects itself. I hope uh, I answered your question, but yeah, that's uh, my point. Yeah. Yeah, I just I think we like, lost Prashant for a while. So uh, till he comes back, maybe we can move on to the next expert. Uh, Mr. Hemendra Mathur, would you like to uh, share your comments? Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, Obi. Uh, it was uh, good to reconnect. Yeah, same here, Hemendra. Very pleasure to meet you. Meet you. It's been a while. Yeah. It's been a while and good to see people to carbon with the projects. I think that's a pretty sensible pivot. Um, but yeah, I just want to understand your business model. How does it work? How, how do you make money out of it? Sure. To my limited understanding, this agroforestry is kind of scaled because it's easy to measure, including, you know, use of remote thing. Yeah. So the carbon projects in agriculture, there's a lot of distrust. And that's why despite best of the efforts, I don't see too many carbon cred, uh, credit uh, trades happening on the ground, especially mm -hmm. from, from a farmer perspective where they're getting money in the account. So so how do you see this space evolving? Do you see there's a sort of a big play out here, especially for smallholder farmers uh -huh. who depend on a lot of NGOs and players like you, you know, how donors are looking at it, how do, can we improve the data trust sure. so that it become more mainstream? So that's the only question. Otherwise, compliments on, on your progress. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, good, good question. Let me quickly answer that. Uh, we see, uh, I mean, very clearly uh, two opportunities here. Two, uh, it, when I say two opportunities, essentially one from the VCM market itself, which is voluntary carbon markets, where they're trying to create... Uh, carbon credits, which is going through its own uh, ups and downs uh, as, as it's been uh, for, for last year, year and a half now. But we see a significant traction from companies um, uh, implementing uh, insetting projects. It could be Nestle's insetting project. Though it is Nestle's project is small uh, right now, uh, but uh, uh, we have uh, energy companies wanting to look at implementing a nature-based solution uh, for their carbon insetting. Right. Uh, we are we were part of Petronas' uh, sustainability accelerator program where Petronas is looking at implementing a nature-based solution for their palm uh, uh, plantation, which is in huge number. They have uh, capability and also financing to implement. So we 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 see that as as one area which could uh, uh, come up. They will obviously work with these project developers uh, uh, in in implementing. They may not have uh, ability to implement it themselves. Uh, we see. Um, Energy companies uh, trying to do that, food companies trying to do that. So we clearly see an opportunity going over and above food and agriculture as, as a sector who are looking at nature as a means for decarbonization. Secondly, um, what we see uh, high success rate is, as you said, forestry projects are good. Uh, uh, many of them are very credible as well. Um, uh, and a lot of innovation needs to still happen on remote sensing, which is uh, uh, happening along the way. But uh, th that's where we've seen more value for the for the credits. And, and also we've been scaling our business model here is purely based on ac acreage or hectares uh, that, that we do. So of the five uh, carbon project developers that we have as customers, uh, three of them are forestry. Um, you know, one of them is cook stores. Uh, sorry, seven we have. Uh, actually, one of them is uh, cook stores. The other uh, three are uh, field crops. Uh, they're scaling, uh, but um, uh, for example, with one customer itself, uh, we've scaled to 200,000 uh, plus uh, acres, which is field crop uh, for sugarcane and uh, paddy for AWD method of uh, uh, cultivation. We do see that scaling. Yeah, there is a lot of uh, work on the ground that needs to happen for, for scaling. Okay. I would just invite Mr. Ashish Mondal for uh, his observations. Hi, uh, it was uh, nice to uh, hear your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Uh, Sivas, I think probably I'll be repeating the same question um, that, you know, in the field crops, you said about the field crops, uh, uh, would be uh, specifically interested to know that, you know, I mean, uh, how do you capture the carbon you're, you're measuring, the way you are measuring it, uh, and then the reliability of the data, Sure. how costly it is in terms of, you know, uh, gathering so much of data, and then, you know, I mean, whether it's worth it in terms of the, the revenue that you generate out of it. Yeah. So I think uh, largely, uh, if you look at from a carbon project developer standpoint, uh, they will invariably have to do these projects at, in very large scale. Otherwise, uh, um, uh, any carbon projects in small area does not make any sense, right? So uh, one of the example is a customer of ours who has about 300 plus field staff across uh, five different states that they work with. Uh, they are the ones who have got close to 200,000 uh, acres mapped uh, on, on the system itself. Yeah, it is operationally intensive, like I said, but then uh, that's the only way right now. So there is a, a element of remote sensing data it can, uh, uh, which is contributing to the overall uh, uh, data capture, but uh, that's, that's still a small part of the overall data capture. So data is captured across many different uh, uh, you know areas it could be biodiversity to water uh, diversity to um, uh, you know uh, soil uh, data you mean to... the physical data collection yeah yeah, yeah. there is a lot of physical data collection which so is also reliability will be I, I would like to hear from you about the reliability yeah. of the data. so there is a there is a definitely uh, I, I wouldn't say uh, just because there is a platform like this will be 100% data will be reliable there is uh, going to be uh, some sort of uh, checks that need to be built on and that's where uh, uh, some of the efforts also goes in right so one is who collects the data how, how do you actually regulate or govern that uh, data which is created and how do you uh, provide approvals uh, for that data it's always a process uh, but i think the whole sector is actually moving towards uh, uh, at scale which is largely we see uh, remote sensing playing an important role so for example compared to last year to this year we are already able to work with uh, partners where we are able to do the tree counting for example species identification deforestation identification these does not require any uh, uh, field uh, staff. I think it's 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 moving in that direction, which is what uh, we we think uh, will will is the direction in which it's going. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so thank you all. Sorry, thank you. One minute, maybe uh, very quickly, Prashant. We know you got dropped out. So is there any follow up question? You nothing. Have? No, no question. Just a just a, a suggestion. I think uh, great work. I think because the space is evolving so much. Yeah. Just more partnerships with the like of IDH, you know, you will just need a lot more of that because as you rightly said, the space is evolving, the tech is changing. Um, so, you know, whether it's a, you know, global alliances, I think partnerships is going to be the way forward. So just uh, I've wanted to add their input. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Wonderful uh, feedback and, and thanks uh, very much for the comments. Yeah, so we'll move on to the next uh, startup. And before we move on, uh, I am sorry, I missed out on announcing that, uh, you know, this this showcase series is being brought to you under the aegis of the Picky Center for Sustainability Leadership. And uh, HUA is one of our founding members who are supporting us in organizing uh, various sessions and trainings uh, for, uh, you know, Picky membership and MSMEs at large. So uh, moving on to the next uh, startup. I would uh, now like to request Mallesh from Cultivate to uh, share his presentation and thereon uh, the panelists to share their uh, expert views. Yeah, good your evening. presentation is up, Mallesh. We can see it. Okay. Hi, good evening. Uh, Just put it on full you. screen. Is it, are you able to see that? Uh, if you can put it on full screen, it's not yet uh, that. Is it full screen now? Um, I can't see the full screen now, right now. Because for me, it's already in full screen. Uh, maybe Malesh, you have to um, reshare again. I think there's some. Uh, yeah. Is it visible now? Yeah, it's up now. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Good evening, all. Thank you very much for giving this opportunity and uh, good to hear a lot of uh, feedback. I hope this feedback is helping us okay, to sharpen our uh, focus uh, much more better. Cultivate is uh, 
an agritech company and the problem that we are trying to solve is how do we enable our farmers to grow more, more using less water? You know, the population is increasing and it is going to be around 10 billion by 2050. As the population is increasing, the availability of land and the resources are reducing. So that's why it poses a bigger challenge. And it's a known fact that when farmers are using the water and other resources without uh, proper information on their hand, they will end up using more resources to the extent of almost 50% and they get around 40% lesser yield. It's not only these two are the issues, but they're also generating more and more greenhouse gas emissions. All of us are experiencing the global warming and the impact of that. And our solution is basically providing a platform that leverages on IoT uh, sensors, artificial intelligence and machine learning models to give timely information to farmers, specifically focusing on irrigation. And we started in 2016 with a simple prototype. When we started, similar to anybody else, we also thought, okay, we can work in the area of banana kind of horticulture crops that can give, uh, that can help the uh, uh, commercially viable crops. But very soon, thanks to HUL and HUF kind of thing, they asked us to move into paddy, which was the most impactful crop. That the, and also that to a bigger challenge saying that, how can we come out with a core technology that can work with the uh, crop and farmers, okay, who are not getting the best uh, revenue kind of thing. So that's what we started working in 2019. It took us roughly a year to crack that particular thing. Happy to say that we have come out with a patented technology, especially in AWD, which is alternate waiting and drying, that is enabling our farmers to save not only 40% water, but also get around 5% yield increase and also reduce our, their expenses on the uh, fung fungal management, uh, fungal diseases. And most importantly, our program is registered on gold standard because of the digital MRV that we are able to bring in here. And over a period of last uh, six years, we have got around 16 customers. We being a B2B model, we are focusing on customers who are working with farmers. It could be the seed manufacturers or it could be the uh, companies who are working with the FPO kind of thing. And together we have covered close to 27,000 plus acres of land uh, spread across North India and some part of South India. And as you can see, the amount of water farmers are consuming is huge, especially when you are focusing on crops like paddy and sugarcane. And on average, they consume close to two crore liters per year per per acre per hectare kind of thing. So that's where you are able to see roughly around 3.8 plus billion liters of water. And when we are working with farmers who are lifting water from the tube well, obviously there is a saving on electricity. And our target is basically uh, how do we move forward from where we are and hit around 50,000 acres of land in this coming Karib season. Uh, currently, we are working in uh, seven states of India and also three countries outside India. And our tech platform, there are three layers in this. One is basically IoT sensor that are sitting on the ground where we continue to collect data. And second one is using a weather station, how we'll be able to collect the data just above the ground and remote sensing. I heard in the previous conversation that remote sensing data is not accurate. That is where Cultivate has got a hybrid model where we get the ground truthing through IoT, which reduces the human intervention to a larger extent and get the data more accurately. Once we collect the data, then it gets into the analytics layer where we check what is the threshold. Threshold is nothing but what is the point at which the farmer should start irrigating the crops. So the system continues to monitor with a frequency of every 30 minutes. And the moment the system detects a particular crop is asking for water, then it moves into the control layer where it can either send a message to a farmer if he is a paddy growing farmer, or it can take full control in case of crops like horticulture crops. And it's not that we just send a message to a farmer and uh, hope that he's going to be doing fine. We also have got a monitoring layer. There are three levels that we have built in here to make sure that the compliance is more than 80, 85% on average. The first level, as I mentioned, is sending a message. This message is a simple SMS we send it to farmer. And we have noticed around 20-25% uh, of the farmers take action based upon the message that they receive. But the challenge is with the remaining set of farmers. So once we notice a farmer has not taken action after receiving a message, for the next 24 hour duration, we have a mechanism where it automatically escalates to a local call. When I say local call, it is a call that goes on to the farmer's mobile in the local language, uh, telling him we had sent a message yesterday, but you have not done the irrigation. Your crops are asking for water, please do irrigate. Now we have noticed basically with a call, the percentage of farmers who irrigate goes to roughly around 50%. So if we notice a farmer who has not done the irrigation in spite of a message and a call, then it automatically gets escalated to the field officer. The combination of these three has helped us to make sure that the adherence to our advisories reaches roughly around 80%. And the reason why we are very particular about advisory adherence is because that is our source of revenue where carbon is generated and farmers will continue to stick with this only if they are able to see higher yield and lesser spent. 
So making sure farmer understands what we are asking them to do and adhere on a timely basis one of the key drivers of this entire thing. And in our full stack, we have got what we are seeing, which is already commercialized on the left hand side, which is irrigation advisory for crops like paddy. And also in some cases of sugarcane, we are giving simple advisories. And for crops that are horticulture crops, such as banana, grapes, pomegranate, and even sugarcane in some cases, we have got smart irrigation where we have the ability to not only give the advisory to these crops, but also control the pump, open the valve, close the valve, everything using IoT, which is completely wireless. And the third one is basically greenhouse automation, where we are able to understand what is the temperature, humidity, and the light condition inside a poly house, and automatically turn the, what do you call, the exhaust fans or the cooling system or the fogger for the boomers kind of thing. So everything happens in a seamless fashion. The key difference is it also captures the data in terms of what has happened, when it has happened, which will help the agronomist to understand why the yield is lower or why there is a particular pest kind of thing. And the fourth one on our already commercialized the full stack solution is automatic weather station, which is our own creation kind of thing, which is doing very well, where we can give advisory to a large group of farmers based on the data that we collect from the weather station, leveraging on the evapotranspiration. On the right hand side, what I have put it under pre commercialization, that's our first carbon program, where it's already registered on gold standard in India. And happy to say that Cultivate is the first company to register, followed by Bayer Crop Sensors. So, here the key difference is the digital MRV, where we are able to collect the data from the ground at an affordable price. Because when we talk about IoT, obviously people think it's very expensive. But having been in this industry for the last five, six years and having gone through three, four iterations over a period of last four seasons, we are able to nail down the price point and make it very, very affordable. And the last one where we are still working on that, which would be launched over a period of next uh, 12 to 18 months is smart fertigation. Where rather than allowing the farmer to provide the fertigation on once and every fortnightly basis or a monthly basis, our intervention intention is basically how can we enable the farmer to give almost daily or alternate day basis with a slightly increased dosage to enable the crops to absorb the right amount of nutrition on a day-to-day -day basis, something similar to all of us consuming food. And this is just a brief description of how it works, which I explained earlier. When the thresholds are breached, the farmer gets a message and the call and followed by a uh, field of escalation. On the left-hand side, what you are seeing, when the water level goes above the ground level, because agronomically it is told, farmer need not irrigate more than one inch. But since water is free and electricity is free and also sometimes there will be labor challenges, farmer thinks there is no harm in over flooding the field. Of course, it helps them to kill the weeds and other things, but it becomes a serious issue with the sustainability aspect. So the whole intervention is how do we make it profitable to the farmer, which what you are seeing on the right hand side, once the water depletes below the ground, and at the same time, make it sustainable by not by enabling them to understand they don't need to over irrigate, which is on the left hand side. A small video of one minute. Punjab's distinction of being the highest producer of rice in the country has come at a huge cost. Water tables in the state have fallen dramatically as farmers need large quantities of groundwater to grow rice. Cultivate developed a static sensor that measures soil moisture level and sends data in real time every 30 minutes to cloud servers. When moisture levels drop in the soil, the farmer receives a message to irrigate his fields. Once soil moisture reaches the appropriate level, another message goes to the farmer to stop his pump. This precise advice to farmers allows them to let fields dry up and flood alternatively, thus saving 50% of water. So our entire value proposition is from a corporate perspective, how do we make them more sustainable, which is measurable kind of thing, by bringing down the water consumption, water use, okay, in paddy cultivation by up to 50%, and depending on the crop it varies, and energy consumption by up to 50%, and the GAG emissions up to 40%. And when we talk to farmers, they are not interested to understand whether what is saved or not. Then we talk purely about the yield increase and the reduction in the pesticide, fertilizer, and labor kind of thing. And being a B2B model, we wanted to make sure that, okay, when we go to a village, we don't take our own set of people, but rather work with the local entrepreneurs. So that's where we made the entire system that is very easy to install. There is no wires that are running in the field, and it's a low-cost solution. And these are some of the success stories. As you can see, one of the common things that runs across is 
how do you make it profitable to the farmer? So that's where every crop that we take, first we calculate what is the return on the investment that they get and where are they going to get the return? Is it going to be coming from the yield increase or input reduction or labor kind of thing? And of course, for the, from a corporate perspective, we talk about the water saving and other things. And our IP is basically, it's a patented technology. We patented it in India. Now we are trying to secure the patent in US as well as in Philippines because we are seeing good traction that is coming out from different countries, different parts of the world. And it's a low cost. Rather, I would use the word ultra low cost because of various intuition that we have brought in. And when I talk about low cost, many times people may think, okay, it's one kind of one solution going to multiple farmers. No, it's not the case. The solution is very much tailored and customized to every plot. If a farmer is having 10 acres of farmland and if there are uh, 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 10 different soil textures or different varieties that he's doing, he will be getting 10 different alerts, okay, depending upon the requirement of the what requirement at the different plot level. These are of some of our customers and partners. As you can see, there are some big names on the list, okay, along with our partners who are doing a lot of testing like uh, International Rice Research Institute or ICAR or CIMATE. Even Asian Development Bank is doing a pilot with us in a foreign country. And many of the tech giants like Cisco, Google, they all have trusted and invested into us, both in terms of their uh, tools and technologies as well as grants. This is something real-time monitoring I thought I would share with you one or two slides. As you can see on the left-hand side at single farm level, it's showing what's the water level. This is very important because when we talk about this carbon auditing, building trust is very important and there are many issues, many cases where because of the trust deficit, the carbon program has been called off. So here we are giving evidence of what exactly is happening on an every 30 minutes basis. So if anybody wants to audit, it's a matter of they calling a field officer sitting wherever they are, asking the field officer to go to the field and pick a random field that they want and ask him to validate it with a validation. So that's the MRV that we have built. And this talks about how do you work with the farmers to influence their behavior. So if you see the total number of SMSs that has gone in this case is something like around 10,000 and that has gone into 6,434 calls. So that tells cumulatively in this particular case, there are certain set of farmers okay, who took action based on SMS, but there are certain number of calls that has to be initiated. So like that, there are certain number of field officer escalation and field manager escalation. So system can automatically generate who are the farmers who are very proactive, who can become our brand ambassador. At the same time, farmers okay, who need multiple level of follow-ups, who we need to focus on training, educating, and making them aware of them. We are also trying to capture what is the quantum of fertilizer and pesticide that they are using so that when the system is completely done, okay, at the end of the season, we know how much the, what kind of fertilizer and pesticide was used between control and program farmers to demonstrate the benefit in a very seamless fashion. So while we talk about IoT, having the device uptime is very important. So this dashboard, everything is automatically done at the platform. Once we get the data, system automatically compute whether the device was up for all 24 hours or partial kind of thing. Accordingly, green, red, or yellow is given. We have a very strong team. I come with the background of around 20 plus, 24, 25 years of experience in agri plus 20 years of IT experience. Sudarshan, my colleague, who com comes with around 25 plus years of uh, IT and IoT. Bauna, who looks after uh, marketing, also comes with 20 plus years of experience. We have got good set of advisors come with diverse experience. And uh, thank you. I'll pause here and I'll be happy to take questions and sessions. Hi, thank you, Malesh. I would now invite you, panelists. Uh, Prashant, any comments, open comments? No, I've, I've known uh, Cultivate and the work you've been doing, Malesh. So first of all, uh, so great to see the impact that you've been having. And I think you're just honestly getting started. Actually, I've, I've been seeing Cultivate for the last four years. Uh, I, I just had uh, two questions for you. Number one, I think the I think the uh, the benefit for the farmer, I think, has been quite clear. Beyond, let's say, foundations, you know, like ours who are seeking, let's say, on water, uh, you know, the impact of water. Other corporates, uh, you know, what is the impact they've been seeing of your work? I mean... Uh, particularly, let's say, uh, what has been the value proposition for a for a food company so far? I would just like to know about that. Number one, I think the second one is there is, uh, I think the connection between let's say the right time for irrigation, particularly for rice, and therefore then the greenhouse gas emissions for you know because of methane, I think is clear. Is the is the connection for other crops also similar? I, and the reason I'm asking that is with the amount of methane satellites going up, is there a stronger business case more and more for the connection for precision agriculture and uh, uh, you know carbon credits? Maybe it's led by methane. Okay. Thank you. 
see as of now when we are talking to the corporate they commit different use cases like one of our customer who is exporting his uh, produce which is rice to european market his people are asking for uh, sustainably uh, sustainable, uh, sustainable rice platform compliant rice that means you need to demonstrate how much of water has been used and how much of water is saved compared to a control farmer so that is one use case and another trust with whom we are working basically they are looking at how do they offset the water that they are using for their factory consumption so here they are drawing almost more than 10 lakh liters a day and the district administration is not happy because it's a high uh, water stress area so they have come to us saying that if you can work with the farmers in that particular region especially paddy growing farmers and demonstrate a water saving okay beyond anybody's doubt then obviously it's going to be good they can go back to administration and convince them and similarly there are other organizations that are coming from a carbon perspective because they are looking at how do they get into the low carbon uh, rice kind of concept where they can grow paddy that is not that is not generating too much of methane so there are different use cases as uh, as you said rightly it is still an evolving space and we are also learning and growing along with the industry yeah and second one is paddy is known for a flood irrigation that means we saturate the field where methane is emitted because for a period of almost anywhere between 70 to 100 days depending on the crop type the field is flooded in case of sugar cane most often they flood the field for three two or three days kind of thing or maybe a day and they naturally allow it to dry for a period of 15 days so the emission will be there but the quantum of emission what happens between paddy and sugar cane or any other crop is substantially lesser so right now we are looking at the methodology which can help us to reduce the methane or carbon emission from paddy rather than any other crop in other crops when you are controlling the irrigation it is definitely having a positive impact on the yield improvement and reduction on the pest and disease control things understood thank you thanks uh, mr mathur uh, would you like to go next yeah no, thank you i have known malesh for a long time and I think it's fascinating his commitment and passion. So nothing to add. Uh, but um, yeah, I think it's a you know we all know water use efficiency is a bit is a big challenge for for agriculture, not just in India but across the world. The challenge is a lot of these solutions are are kind of heavy lifting. Uh, it needs a lot of education. The GTMs uh, have to be figured out. A validation across crops, etc. So yeah, all I can say, you know, at Fiki, being part of Fiki, we should do a lot of ecosystem support, especially for these kind of startups in terms of customer connects and anything which can help them scale these solutions. Up. So, so I think uh, now, now no questions from my side. I think <laughs> we remain committed to drive this scale to whatever platform that I have, including Fiki. Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. So, uh, uh, Mr. Ashish Mondal, would you like to share your comments? No, actually, uh, frankly speaking, I mean, same as uh, Hemendra, I mean, I mean, we know about the technology, we know the challenges. The only challenge probably to all of us is the how to scale it up. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, and, and I, I think like, you know, government has to probably step up to, to promote such kind of uh, technologies and, you know, for, to educate farmers to use sensor-based technologies to water use efficiency, you know, and, and all, up, across all crops, particularly paddy. Um, yeah, so so no such no specific question to Malish. Yeah. Bobby, would you like to go next? Or your comments? Sure. I am I'm 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 not as close to Malish as many of the others on the panel are. Uh, but I have just a very rudimentary question uh, and a couple of comments. I mean the point on how to scale this business is also, I think everybody is seized off. Uh, but having said that, Malish, on, on first principles, I'm saying what you're saying is uh, what you're doing with the sensor-based technology and the feed going into a mobile phone or an SMS, uh, to me seems fairly, pardon the use of the word, simplistic and somebody else can copy it and things like that quite easily because there are existing technologies already available you put it packaged it together and you know in a in a in a nice way and i think it is commercially at the cost point uh, very efficient uh, my question really is you know is, is, are we able to get a strong ip can you protect that ip so well uh, secondly even if you can um, you know is there a business model that you can build this on because i think the, the benefit to the farm farmer is very very obvious I'm sure there'll be lots of copycats once it becomes successful, who will potentially replicate it. And 
also your need for i would think servicing of farmers and things like that relative to the cost of the saving does it make that business model come under stress so therefore my suggestion would be that i'm thinking this would work equally well all across the world in other markets where you know for more where you can actually in, without any human intervention you can just control the uh, you know direct control of uh, of the irrigation and things like that so are you uh, better off trying to have or would it make sense for you to have one uh, tangent of your business model catering to global solutions which after a point probably some of those solutions can come to india itself which is you know a completely automated irrigation plan and things like that uh, which which could uh, you know work in the developed markets per se so it gives you might in terms of size as well as profitability sure thank you that's a good thought process first of all yes we already patent the deals and it's not just a message and call that goes to the farmer it's question of timing of that okay when do you actually trigger that message and there are different parameters one is if you go agronomically sometime depending on the soil texture it could be taking 8 to 9 days to percolate but there is another challenge of how do you manage the weed so it's a ip that we have created okay that understand basically these different aspects of that and triggers the message to the farmer and the second one is the price point the entry barrier as i said when we started this around 5 years back it was something around uh, close to 10000 rupees per plot kind of thing and uh, this uh, this year we are offering at around almost 1000 uh, rupees so next year more likely will be further dropping the price because we have been in the industry is not only the tech iot technology that we are leveraging we are also leveraging on ai and ml models okay to keep bringing the cost down to make it more affordable at the same time create the entry barrier for our competition and in terms of making it seamlessly integrated with the od call pumps and all those things yes in india that kind of infrastructure does not exist even though we have got the capability we are already doing couple of projects okay with some of the institutes okay who are testing it out but i understand in us especially in texas okay where paddy is grown in some of the areas there is a large opportunity in even texas and uh, uh, different parts of north america kind of thing yes we are yet to explore that and our key driver at this point of time is not necessarily just water alone but carbon credit as uh, srivatsa was mentioning earlier carbon credit there are two kind of thing one is voluntary and one is regulated so we are looking more from a regulated carbon okay which can actually give more value per every car carbon credit and that is going to be accepted accepted at a global level with a much more higher volume right now there are a couple of people who have approached us saying that they want us to generate a million carbon credits so when you talk about million carbon credit over a period of next uh, almost 6 to 7 years till 2030 obviously it's a large number so i see this market slowly picking up but we need to quickly uh, capitalize and uh, protect it yes so uh, to quickly take a round i would like to in, uh, invite our audience if they have any questions uh, please uh, type in your questions in the q and a or the chat box Uh, moving on to the next presentation, I uh, would like to invite Siddharth from Kriyameet. Siddharth, you're ready? Yep, just sharing my screen. So can you see my screen? Um, can you see it's coming up. I can see it. It's 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 coming yeah, it's up. Yeah. It's so thank up. you, uh, thank you, uh, Fiki, and thank you, EQ, for giving us the opportunity. And uh, in the next uh, presentation, I will be giving you a brief uh, an application of what these two guys discussed with respect to carbon credits analyzing the carbon credits and i will give you a real time example of the impact that it actually does so hello everyone i am siddharth i am the co-founder at clear meat which is india's first and only iso certified lab grown meat company with the vision to make sustainable solutions to the food industry when i speak of sustainability let us first understand the food product itself globally out of the existing 8 million population 80% of humans prefer meat and with the increase in population the demand for meat is increasing with every passing day speaking of this increase in demand the, these meat products which are obtained from factory farms are responsible for 30% of the agricultural land consumption 15% greenhouse emissions and utilization of up to 30% of the water footprint 
Apart from that, these factory farms result in overgrazing, erosion, use of antibiotics, use of growth hormones, and many factors, which ultimately impact the whole ecosystem. Moving ahead, as this demand arises, we do have to realize the options to identify alternatives which are more sustainable and provide more healthy solutions to the coming future generation. When you speak, speak of alternative proteins, it gets classified into broadly into two major categories. One is the plant-based way, where plant extracts are taken like soya, mushroom, pea, and then given a shape structure to make it a meat lookalike. But when you speak of animal-based meat, it is actually taking a biopsy from an animal, starting with the uh, meat as the cells, uh, animal cells, and getting 100% meat or meat per se in, as mass of cells. Because this meat is made from 100% original cells, it will always remain the preference of meat eaters. Moving ahead, when you speak of this cultivated meat technology or animal-based meat technology, the idea here is to identify or take a biopsy from a chicken, for example, which we already achieved back in Jan 2020, to take a biopsy of a muscle area from a chicken without killing the animal, identifying the key cells that are required to make a mass of cells or a core of cells. For example, in a chicken case, we work on different cell types. So we identify muscle cells, providing these muscle cells the right nutrition so that they can multiply and uh, reproduce or create large masses of cells using cell growth media ultimately to come up with a minced meat or a chicken burger or a chicken nugget. Now, this whole process does not use any antibiotics or does not involve any animal killing. But when you speak of it or compare it with traditional meat industry, the only difference between traditional meat and animal-based technology or cultivated meat technology is the input and output material are always same. Input being the number of cells and output being mass of cells. How this uh, production is controlled or processed actually governs the whole sustainability and the alternative protein idea and makes this different in the longer run. When we worked on the cultivated meat technology, we identified that there are four key pillars that are actually responsible for governing the cost and the acceptance when it comes to cultivated meat. The first factor being cell lines itself, the starting material that is cells or cell banks that we speak of. The second factor, as I identified in the method, is cell growth media or fetal bovine serum, scientifically known as. The third being the methods, how manufacturing is done, use of step forward, use of bioreactor. And fourth being licensing, using the right FMCG corridors, sales and marketing and likewise. Now, in these four pillars, when you speak of alternative protein made through animal source, yes, it seems you are not killing any, any, any animal. There is no use of uh, any growth hormones and likewise. So, yes, it will have an impact on the sustainability and you will get a more sustainable meat product at the end of the day. But the difference here is use of cell growth media. When we worked ahead on these lines, we identified that this cell growth media, scientifically known as fetal bovine serum, has an application in cell culture, in providing nutrition to the cells, in drug discovery, vaccine production, and various, uh, and it has a bioavailability issue. Now, this cell growth media not only is obtained by killing calves, so there is a non-unsustainable method of obtaining it, but is responsible for 60% of the production cost. It impacts the whole vision of alternative protein industry from an animal-based methodology perspective. Speaking specifically of this cell growth media, it is obtained, as I mentioned, by killing calves. It uses a lot of, uh, requires a lot of factory farms to rear these cows. The methods are totally non-sustainable. And again, the product itself is expensive because of the procedure. Countries like India, so globally, 90% of the countries are dependent or import only for fetal bovine serum. Do remember that I mentioned fetal wine serum is used extensively not only for uh, any food tech setup, but also for routine biotech, which includes research and drug discovery and vaccine production. If I speak of the numbers from an Indian perspective, India during COVID for vaccine production imported somewhere around $24 million of fetal wine serum itself. Total time of fetal wine serum is itself $1.2 trillion. Moving ahead. At ClearMeet, what we did is we started working on these four pillars or pain points of this industry to fo focus on the production costs and all other factors, which will ultimately impact the acceptance of the product. We started working on the cell lines, the first pillar. We created our own cell bank. We created our own in-house cell lines. We started working with chicken. We are now working with uh, mutton. We are working with fish. We are work working with camel. We are working with crabs. For cell growth media, what we do, did is, as India was import only, and it was price sensitive issue for us, apart from the bioavailability, which has a chart of somewhere around six months, we started identifying, coming from a biology, uh, molecular biology background, we started focusing on the key biological pathways that are actually responsible for providing or activating 
nutritional activations of these cells. So we started identifying mimics of this fetal bovine serum from our uh, available resources and plant extracts became the available resources. So we created a formulation which is now patent granted in India, patent filed in US. We created our own formulation with the lines of Clarex 9, which was focused to replace fetal bovine serum and we used it to make our own mass of cells. Now in this whole method, now for us at Clear Meat, we started working on all these four pillars from cell lines to cell growth media and the methodology making us or converting us into an ingredient supplier to the world and ultimately focusing on becoming the intel inside of the alternative protein industry. When you speak of fetal bovine serum, as I mentioned, it does not use any animal killing because the extracts are plant-based. It helps us bring the price down of usage of fetal bovine serum. Because we make our own fetal or cell growth media, we are able to understand the reusability, taking charge of these circular methodology methods and ultimately becoming more sustainable in the longer run when it comes from both carbon credits and the impa impact that it will have in the society for the future generations. Moving ahead, this actually helps us understand the whole clear meats vision, which is ultimately becoming a B2B value chain supplier for the globe, empowering other food tech companies or biotech companies so that they can start working on cell culture or grow cells in a more sustainable or a healthy way to begin with. This fits in with the vision of the company that is to become the world's largest producer of safe, sustainable meat solutions with the lowest carbon footprint. We are more of a B2B company which provides uh, ingredients which are required to empower other cell-based companies so that they can work on the impact or application of cell culture. Moving ahead, our products as on date include not only meat products, we have our own eco meat, uh, which is made by 100% meat and hybrid meat. We also have a pet food uh, category now. Apart from that, we have our own cell growth media, which goes by the name of ClearX9. And we have already started, we did a soft launch of our ClearX9 back in September 23. And now we have sold somewhere around 200 liters plus of cell growth media till date. In India, so in total, we have somewhere around 39 customers uh, as of now. And uh, out of these 39 customers, it was surprising for us also. Because out of these 39 customers, 30 are from India. India does not have any other alternative animal-based protein company. So our 30 customers mostly included hardcore research labs like IIT, JNU, Molana Azad Medical College, Ames, but also included hospitals which use our cell growth media for skin grafting, growing cells for skin grafting. It is being currently validated, it has actually passed that uh, approval. It is being used by vaccine production industries for using or replacing fetal bovine serum from their routine uh, application, making it more sustainable from the vaccine production line. So out of these 30 clients, we have both research, we have a biotechnology application, and we have nine clients outside India. We have clients in Australia, New Zealand, Europe, and uh, UK, which are focused on using our cell growth media to make raw meat for their local audience. And that is, fits in with the vision of Clear Meat that is providing the ingredients or becoming the intel inside of alternative protein. Based on the applications of the products that we have in our kitty, we have actually divided our business strategy into two parts. One is short-term business strategy and another is long-term business strategy. We do realize in our road shows that it has become important for us to make the audience or the consumer aware of the impact these sustainable methods have. And there, this requires a lot of groundwork. Parallelly, because these are new ways of doing it, not from a capex point, but also from adoption point, the existing cell culture setups or the companies which are involved in routine cell culture setup, we need these ingredients to be incorporated in the routine before they become mainstream. Our short-term vision is actually focused on penetrating our sustainable ways of growing cells in a controlled environment to these industries and making clients and making some revenue out of it. Our long-term vision is actually focused on bringing the lab-grown meat or cultivated meat on shelf to people to try it out. Um, uh, moving ahead, we uh, from the journey that we started, as I mentioned, uh, we first created the company was registered in June 2019. Since, since then, we have been uh, vigorously working on different milestones, starting with making our own initial chicken keema in lab in Jan 2020, and then focusing on the price parity, understanding the industrial POCs, launching ClearX9, and now actually working on the licensing part of the eco meat format, and going ahead with the launch of our cultivated meat. We are currently based in Delhi, and uh, when you speak of the impact that we do, the, from a perspective of the last one and a half years of exercise that we have done, we have been able to, because of the sustainable methods that we have put forth, we have been able to save approximately 120 cows and have been able to impact 45 tons of greenhouse emissions till date. And also it uh, also helps us to bring down the production cost of the lab-grown meat at a price parity which is acceptable to the consumer in India. 
uh, moving ahead. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, we have a small team of 15 members, a mix of uh, both research scholars, hardcore research scholars, and people from the marketing domain. We are currently based in Delhi, uh, Noida, and have a small 1,500 square feet facility, which churns out 150 liters of cell growth media every uh, month and makes somewhere around one to two kilograms of meat every 45 days till the time we do not get licenses and we do not upgrade ourselves. Uh, we are currently, we already have raised five rounds of uh, funds uh, through CCDs and some of our investors include Mistletoe, Brink, Gastroprop, Artesian and Bits Bios in Goa. We are currently in the phase of raising bridge round where we have intentions to go for uh, country specific patent filing. We have identified 30 plus patents to be filed in globally. Uh, issuing CCDs, issuing shares to our current CCDs and expanding our uh, dedicated sales team. With this, I pause it and thank you for listening to me and hope you join us on the whole thought process. Uh, thank you, Siddharth. The floor is open for panelists. So that maybe I can go first. Uh, uh, and first and foremost, congratulations on uh, a very unique space that you have decided to play in. And uh, uh, honestly, uh, uh, almost everything of how this technology behind you see uh, was something of news to me. I, I mean, though one one does read about impossible foods um, or beyond meat and companies like that, which uh, you know have created. Thing, impossible foods between seven to billion dollar, ten billion dollars of value. So I think obviously there's a lot of value in that space. Uh, I have just one question, or I mean, I don't know if the cost question or a comment, uh, because I think what you've really done with ClearX Nine uh, is, is generated uh, an alternative, which on from a B two B perspective, uh, at least on the on face on the face of it, is on par with the products in the market is more cost effective and obviously has a much lower carbon footprint uh, and has clear advantages, right? Uh, so would it be or would it make sense for you to focus on growing that part of the business quite substantively as opposed to getting into the B2C portion, which is around the meat per se, because I think it's not just the meat that you'll probably need. You'll need to have recipes around it. You'll have to find partnering with you know uh, the 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 mm -hmm. chefs or the or the famous uh, I mean the amount of money that will go into launching a product and making it acceptable. Um, on what plank will you sell it on? Because to be selling it on a carbon footprint on a meat product in India or in this part of the world might not be very um, uh, you know appealing to a lot of buyers, right? I mean, whereas it might appeal to a niche audience. So that's a my to my mind that's a much more capital intensive, time intensive effort intensive uh, mode of growth. So uh, uh, I, I, I just wanted your comments on that. Are you better off focusing on the B2B and growing that into what can be a substantive business, right? Uh, so uh, uh, you, are, you have actually raised the right, uh, right question. This was something which we discussed two years back. And your question is actually gets divided into three parts. And I will answer every part. The first part you uh, mentioned about impossible and beyond. And uh, the whole idea is we also realized in the last two years that there is a lot of confusion between us and impossible. Impossible is a plant-based entity and we are animal-based. And th these discussions which actually help us do the corrections in the past. So the first part stands here. We are slightly different. And from the market perspective, we are focused on consumers uh, from a meat part, which are into 100% uh, non-vegetarians or which are looking for a more sustainable or guilt-free product. The second part of your question, uh, focusing on uh, cell growth media, yes, you rightly pointed. We have the our, because of this ingredient uh, benefit or USP that we have achieved in the last couple of years. That is the prime reason we shifted our or created a strategy which was divided into two parts: short term and long term. Short term was focused on pushing the whole cell growth media perspective because we realized cell growth media not only has an application in production of meat but also has application in routine research and biotech. And it had more potential to become, for us to become uh, quickly uh, positive on uh, numbers. So the whole idea of, of the short-term business strategy was to become self-sufficient and make more sense in the market till the time, now this, your third part, the consumer becomes re uh, ready to accept this product. From a uh, path of the consumer's understanding, 
what we have realized and uh, you will be surprised from an indian cont context also 70% of we indians more than 70% it is 75% now are non vegetarian so these are all occasional non vegetarians from an, those numbers because this was a shock to us also we did not thought that we will get a very positive response for our product when we started making it for doing a routine tasting that we do chefs in india want us to put it on shelf and i will not name the companies there are certain big fmcg uh, fm uh, some certain big companies which have actually now signed uh, ndas with us to figure out the application of this processed meat because it ultimately fills into the criteria of a processed meat industry to bring out applications of this processed meat and it actually fits in our thought process that is pushing in the ingredients empowering other companies so that they can work on the capex when it comes to how it should be presented how it should be tasted and how it should look because uh, there is one point i normally add uh, uh, from a consumer's part we have realized that any consumer or any food product has five basic parameters number one is taste number two is texture number three is smell number four is nutrition and number five is price we coming from a research background have a more hand holding or an understanding how to solve a problem and bring out bring out more sustainable ways of doing it so we took a step back focused on the ingredients and intention is to empower other players who are into hardcore manufacturing provide them the ingredients and the capex that is required so that is the reason we became more b2b and ingredient supplier oriented and fits into into the vision that is becoming the intel inside of alternative proteins i hope i answered it uh, mr mathur Yeah, no, nothing specific. We have known Siddharth for a long time. <laughs> a great example of a deep tech, deep biotech exam, you know, company out of India. Uh, developed this solution at a very very low cost as compared to many global competitors. So it's it's a great, great product. Uh, at uh, at a decent level of uh, development cycle and ready for commercialization in many ways. So. uh no uh, no specific questions uh, uh, again a great opportunity uh, uh, for all of us to drive this category and as siddharth clarified it it shouldn't be confused with other all protein sort of businesses um yeah i think the key challenge and opportunity here is how do you bring the cost of meat down sort of to make it affordable to masses i think that's where a lot of work will go in time to come uh, but i think it's a it's a classic example of a deep tech solution uh, in the food category very few exist um, and again as, as fiki we should we should support the solutions in sort of going to markets outside india and i think it also need a lot of laboratory support and validation support which is another critical area where we can help start up like clear meat so great work siddharth keep it up thank you thank you thank you sir thank you just wanted to add one more point here thank you for that brief uh, because of fiki we have been able to get in touch with i think two clients who have actually approached us through presentations to fiki and we have signed agreements with them on the product part i just wanted to give it uh, to record it on air that's quite wonderful so if there are no more questions and in the interest of time we'll move on to the next presentation Karan, we are ready for you. Uh, good afternoon, to all. Uh, my name is Karan Thalswa. I'm just sharing my screen. Yeah, is my screen visible? But it's coming up, Karan. Yeah, it's there. Yes. You can just put it on full screen. Yeah, it's there. Yes. So my name is Karan. I am the founder and CEO of Aviva Green Technologies, founded in 2018. Uh, we are one of the first companies in India to do an extensive research and development on the word called plant called as hemp, which is also known as cannabis. A very controversial and a very interesting product. Uh, 
crop that we are actually having a tug of war these days. But uh, one of the most uh, uh, upcoming as well as fastest growing industry in the in the global level. So we are basically doing research on extensive use of uh, cannabis in multiple ways. Like uh, it is already mentioned on global scale that uh, 50,000 odd products can be made out of cannabis. But eventually what else other than smoking can be done? So we came up with a solution where uh, we started our uh, study about the product in 2015 while I was doing my uh, bachelor's where we uh, did our first uh, pilot project on biodiesel, creating a biodiesel out of uh, hemp seed oils, where we achieved zero carbon emission on just B20 blend. And we patented the process uh, with an enzymatic process that uh, we do, uh, which makes it uh, more efficient. As well as in 2017 onwards, we developed a hemp exhaust muffler, which uh, also solves the problem of air pollution as well as uh, for automotive. It is a greatest uh, boon for them to like have an exhaust system which can increase the efficiency as well as uh, increase uh, the uh, power performance as well as reduce the carbon emissions by 60%. Uh, Along with the whole journey, we also developed uh, in 2018, we came up with uh, hemp body panel parts for uh, vehicles. Like currently, we are facing a lot of crisis with uh, solid waste. So we created uh, uh, India's first hemp body panel parts for the vehicle, which can actually replace your plastic, which are more durable as well as uh, less uh, hazardous uh, during accidents. Uh, later on in 2019, we developed world's first hemp wood, which is a perfect replacement for your uh, teak wood and uh, teak wood and the oak woods uh, and avoid deforestation, which has been a problem today where uh, several uh, hectares of lands are being erased of just for uh, extracting the environment. Along with the COVID, uh, everything came at a uh, halt where uh, we, we also were facing similar kind of issues. So we had to come up with something related to hemp. So now uh, let me introduce that uh, hemp has antibacterial, antifungal as well as antiviral properties as well within the fibers. So we developed world's first HN95 mask, which we called as the Canspirator mask for COVID, which is uh, tested by Ministry of Textile as well as acknowledged by them, procured by them during COVID uh, for distribution. And this was the only mask which was washable and can be used up to six months after you can reuse it. And uh, further on in 2021, we won the uh, Agri-India Hackathon as well as the Textile Grand Challenge Award for uh, replacement of plastic from hemp-based uh, uh, bags, which uh, we are currently uh, serving and as well as supplying uh, hemp packaging various countries across uh, the globe. Along with that, uh, currently we developed a bicycle which uh, got supplied to the Dubai-based uh, company and we are looking forward for mass production. This is a, a distinguished team uh, which uh, cumulatively we have more than like uh, 50 years of experience cumulatively. Uh, our potential market currently uh, is basically uh, UK, UAE, India, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and USA. And we're also working with uh, the companies out there for distribution across EU and Saudi Arabia. So now why, should, why India needs help? So it is the fastest growing mass, like it is also termed as weed because uh, it is one of the fastest growing masks which doesn't require any kind of caretaking. 
so it also absorbs three times uh, almost four times the carbon dioxide from the uh, as compared on to the trees and it uh, grows within a span of like 12 to 14 weeks that's the fastest thing whereas trees take more than 20 years to mature and four months of uh, this thing growth so currently the agricultural states where the agricultural lands are available are like 159.7 million hectares where uh, hemp currently has been legalized for uh, licensed farmers in jammu kashmir jammu and kashmir for medical cannabis himachal pradesh are uh, legalizing it for uh, industrial use uttarakhand for industrial use and medical cannabis uttar pradesh for uh, medical cannabis madhya pradesh for medical cannabis and orissa so whatever is the output uh, we have a global market which is which has uh, 103.9 billion dollars and this will keep on growing at a scale uh, cagr of uh, 6.7% per year so looking at the aspect uh, currently i would like to quickly give you a brief about uh, what all uh, sectors are basically making money out of cannabis uh, the major major stakeholders are personal care and medical uh, out of which uh, like for example if you have invested 50000 uh, by any uh, farmer he can yield up to 5 lakh rupees from the after post harvest station by selling the raw material to the industry industry uh, respective industries whether which includes food which includes industrial application other products textile cbd which is uh, hemp cbd 23% which is uh, basically related to medicines and supplements uh, which are like uh, regular energy based uh, things so why india what is the thing that is stopping us from doing this hemp since it is a new industry we are basically restricted with the hsn codes to be uh, developed yet uh, currently we are working with ministry of textile and ministry of agriculture hand in hand and since we are incubated at uh, pusa krishi uh, delhi uh, we have been uh, following up with them uh, so helping them out in uh, developing the hsn codes uh, scientific uh, study and rest of the material scientific data that they require in terms of testing and this thing uh, as well as we also need to make benchmarks as per bi standard which currently india doesn't have but soon uh, once the data has been collected from our end, definitely we will have a very strong uh, standard uh, data procedure which uh, will have a global level uh, global level impact for like having the products manufactured in india uh, the blockchain is in process uh, which uh, we are currently pre- preparing for the government of india as well as uh, the process is okay so let me know what is how does this business model works so basically it includes uh, global hemp companies currently in overall india there are more than 425 hemp companies uh, out of which government policy and policy makers like ministry of textile ministry of agriculture are actively getting involved where they are considering hemp as an alternative fiber replacement or you can say like uh, a substitute to cotton jute and uh, rest of the agricultural based fibers that are being produced across india scientists and researchers labs like uh, icar uh, ncl uh, then uh, we have uh, csir uh, government scientists who are working extensively uh, along with the in the industries for government of india local farmers we we have a connect of a uh, network of over 500 uh, farmers across india for cultivation of hemp uh, so that's how uh, the use of the seed happens to like uh, we have so many products uh, around us right from industrial paper building material food 
currently uh, you can see uh, we have an uh, innovative pa patented process for developing hemp based and other feedstock solution biodiesel processing where we do end to end uh, turnkey projects for clients like sq mass transfer srs biodiesel in usa and engineering in uh, australia so these companies are companies uh, whom we basically provide uh, our uh, turnkey solutions for setting up plants and uh, refineries of uh, biodiesel in automobiles uh, we recently have a patent in the uh, hemp exhaust muffler which we are soon in working to like uh, assign this to one of the most renowned uh, automobile company and uh, testings uh, we got it certified from icac uh, which is uh, international center for automotive testing in delhi uh, which uh, is which makes us uh, india's first and the only aftermarket exhaust uh, which is certified and as per regulation it is under the regulatory standards which any company would like to have uh textile merchandise we also serve in this sector where uh, we supply b2b to uh, several sectors uh, like several sectors like hemp people from dubai and hemp innovation in uk so we manufacture right from shirt clothing to like uh, active wear uh, casual wear uh, knit wears and uh, shoes Uh, merchandise and rest of the stuff. Uh, yes, this is one of uh, the interesting sectors, civil engineering, uh, where hemp crete it is a perfect replacement for your, uh, for your concrete. So currently, we all are experiencing with concrete. We have uh, heat issues where you have to. Uh, Uh, during summers you need you can't live without acs but uh, with hem with hempcrete the thing is uh, the block of uh, one block of hempcrete equivalent to concrete it is five times lighter in weight secondly it is perfect insulation carbon negative which absorbs carbon in it and uh, it actually maintains the insulation level at a very high level within the room the temperature is like 25 degrees celsius and outside temperature is basically 40 degrees celsius the inner temperature won't be affected so it has a fire retardancy properties which can bear up to like uh, 1200 degrees celsius without burning and appliances uh, where we have install, installed all of this is itc hotel andaman nikoba uh, samgor india nashik uh, western india wapi and parini builders in mumbai so yeah this is what i was talking about of the hemp tree the hemp board has been installed where uh, civil apply with application and benefits that uh, our clients are having uh, yes sustainable stationery and packaging uh this is a need of the earth for a world uh, to like switch to a sustainable and a replacement for like uh, plastic packaging so our packaging is uh, lightweight it is antibacterial antifungal uh, waterproof uh, if required any food grade coating you can also involve that along with that uh, we have been providing a packaging solution to various companies in europe uh, for uh, the play uh, replacement of conventional uh, paper uh, with hemp uh, fiber based uh, boxes uh, for especially for whiskies and uh, whisky packaging which requires uh, good tensile strength as well as impact uh, resistant uh, this thing along with it it should be fire resistant uh, so this is a solution which we complete uh, which gly gives and covers or most of the sector our uh, defense currently we are working with uh, drdo for development of uh, certain uh, defense products and so the project is still going on uh, we also have uh, developed hemp plastic replacement for plastic uh, uh, plastic bottles 
uh, which can degrade within 90 days. So this, uh, these trials and piloting are in process where uh, we are looking forward for like a good response from the market. And uh, yeah, uh, we have been doing this all of uh, by ourselves uh, in the bootstrap mode. Uh, recently, we got uh, seed funding from uh, Pusa Karishi for the uh, development of the hemp bags for the market. And uh, soon we are looking forward for more uh, raising funds for our company in order to like uh, give this scope and this industry of hemp uh, to grow la huge in the coming years. Uh, the best part of all of this is uh, with the cultivation of hemp uh, in whole of India, we can actually uh, offset 500 billion tons of carbon, di uh, carbon dioxide. Now, the, these were the stats uh, till 2022. And uh, recent study, uh, what as per our team, we could uh, help increase it by more 10% with our efficient uh, engineering processes. Along with that, uh, 240 crore liters of fuel is also saved on this whole of process because hemp does not require water. Secondly, uh, the exhaust uh, system or the biodiesel, it actually increases the efficiency of the vehicle. So the consumption of fuel goes down. Third thing, employment generation would be 50,000 people per year. That also includes farmers uh, joining in every, every month with us. Uh, Pan India and uh, government, uh, we are actually working with the government to uh, increase the subsidies from 25 to 40% for these uh, farmers as well as us as manufacturers so that they get uh, more uh, enhancement as well as they, uh, they are basically like, um, they are more encouraged uh, for opting the, these kind of farming. And currently, a uh, recent uh, study from uh, Germany, uh, we got to know that the carbon credits for hemp uh, farming, the cost has rose up to like, it was, earlier it was $8 per kilo uh, as carbon credits. Current price is ranging between $20 per kg. Uh, and... Uh, Current, sorry to you know, come in between. Uh, 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 would your presentation be as an? Uh, is it, it? It'll still take time because I no no. Possibly... I have completed it. I have yes, completed. Sure. It. Sure. Okay. So sorry, but you know we overshot and. Uh... No problem. I was just. No no no. I was just uh, finishing off as as it, as it was the last sure. Yes. So I invite the panel members to share their observations, please. Um, Mr. Mondal had to leave. He uh, has put it on chat, so yeah. Uh, maybe I can go first so that uh, get it over with. Uh, sure. is no, I mean, I had read about him being the miracle plant because of various reasons. It uses less water, it's you know, the soil, all of that. But with the number of applications you've outlined, it's, it's like, a, you know, it's much more than a miracle. It's too good to be true. Uh, that is, <laughs> that, yeah. That's also my comment also, which is that I think you've, you've developed so I many guess. wonderful products, which I think if I take it at face value, each of them has enormous potential. My only Absolutely. refrain at this moment is that I think you have to take a decision on which are the ones that you would want to prioritize based on the size of the opportunity, your ability to access that opportunity, uh, how do you access that market? Because if you want to do a category change and things like that, these are going to take time. So you want to actually get to where you can ride on something that's already there. For instance, if I look at your customer base, if you're working with smart auto part companies for whom the end consumers are looking at, you know, greening their vehicle and things like that, because already the movement from metals to plastics, Plastic to hemp can be a good movement. Muffler, these are things that does not come into the eye of the customer. These are things that goes inside the part of the vehicle. So the customer doesn't know, but it is a green product. It is a better outlet. Therefore, in many ways, I think the OEMs are also open to accessing as long as the performance of the product is on par. Uh, you're also able to get you know traction and volume size very quickly. So my compliments to you on the scale and diversity of products you've built. My 
suggestion to you is uh, I think you will need to quickly prioritize and see which ones and maybe there are a few trial and error but it's important for you to do that fairly quickly so that you can actually get many of these starting to make money from which you can then continue on your uh, journey on other products as well. Yes, sir, absolutely. Uh, like, uh, thank you for the compliments. And uh, currently, uh, working with Ministry of Textile, uh, we are making special, uh, specially abled uh, fabrics for special use for defenses. You can save for export purpose for various countries. Like uh, recently, we participated in Bharat Tech, and uh, we got a good traction for like uh, hemp uh, being. Uh, used for defense purpose like uh, it could be a greater use because earlier uh, back uh, if you have heard about it I don't know but I would like to share uh, that in the Vietnam war uh, Americans actually switched on to their uniforms from cotton to hemp just because they were facing uh, bacterial and fungal issues uh, in Vietnam so those kind of features, if you can get it in a natural material, uh, and if we promote this, uh, like uh, I did not share this during the presentation, but I would like to uh, share this uh, information, like uh, from the director of uh, the uh, uh, Ministry of Textile Head of Northern Region, they just say, shared a very sad news that people from the Northern Belt are actually isolating their farms and uh, villages just because they are not able to cultivate. So it has been a challenge. But uh, with him, uh, all these animals, they cannot eat that. Uh, and these fibers are so useful for the industries. We are actually trying to bring up a whole new uh, industry to start off with with fabrics uh focusing on automotive yes uh, we are in process of uh, getting it tested and as well as uh, having optimization in the thickness of material that uh, currently we are being used so it uh, it will take some time with the testing and uh, parameters along with these uh, companies uh, who are uh, interested in these uh, uh, exhaust systems or and uh, all the body so my, my suggestion is you can decide where you want to prioritize but prioritization absolutely, is very critical absolutely. i think at this stage so that's absolutely possible. yes sir thank you thank you sir thank you i think just same comments as bobby i think the i learned a lot today on hemp i think the prioritization is going to be very important um and uh, yeah because each of these industries are very different um unless you become a, a consultant who is going to talk about hemp technology to multiple industries right i think it's it's very very important that you prioritize but otherwise it's really great to know the kind of uh, deep tech companies material companies which are coming up in india so compliments karan thank you thank you so much thank you prashant uh, so, uh, Mr. Mathur, is he still there? Thus? I think he had to leave. Yeah, he had to leave. If you can bring the session to a close. Yeah, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we would like to... Uh, I don't know whether my video is on. Uh, so I would just uh, thank everyone. And... Uh, uh, a great thank you to, we would like to express our gratitude to the panel of experts for sharing their experience and insights uh, with these startups. Uh, we also thank all the presenters. It's encouraging to learn from ClearMade that, you know, Fiki has been helpful uh, in their success journey. Uh, uh, as part of the Fiki Center for Sustainability Leadership, we would be glad to further be of help to the new age companies, uh, you know, which are into promoting sustainability across sectors. And, uh, you know, happy to connect with any of you and uh, the presenters uh, in the future. Abba, anything you would like to... Thank you all. About? Thank you. And we apologize for the extra time we've taken off your calendars. Thank you so much. Thank you yeah. for the opportunity. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. And...